Hello, this is David Allen again with another G.I. Joe New News Review. I am joined by my special guest, author, writer, personality, Buzz Dixon. Uh, he has been around the industry, animation industry, television industry, film industry, comic book writing for decades. Mm -hmm. And some of the work that he's uh, done uh, is... Um, He's worked on, I guess, the G.I. Joe, the most dangerous man in the world, based on the last episode of G.I. Joe from the animated series. He's done some graphic novels for Serenity. Uh, mm -hmm. He's worked on video games, Terminator and Tiny Toons, I guess. Uh, he's done film work on Dark Planet and Terror and Paradise, mm -hmm. along with uh, a laundry list of uh animation and television work that i can't even list but it says in his bio on his page that he wrote my childhood and i have to say buzz you wrote my childhood and that is true thank you thank you that was uh i forget who hung that on me but uh several years ago somebody made that comment about me and everybody who heard it went yeah that's pretty much it so I, I will not argue with people on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, some of the things that I noticed while I was researching you, I knew some things about you, the, 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 the most popular things I knew about you, but I didn't know some of these writing credits that you had on shows mm -hmm. that I absolutely love, uh, mm -hmm. like Plastic Man. I loved Plastic Man growing up as a kid. Bionic mm -hmm. Six, God, that was a beautiful series. Uh, Thunder mm -hmm. of the Barbarian, Jack Kirby. Oh, my God, you've done so many things over the years, and you've worked on so many uh, uh, childhood uh, uh, projects that mm -hmm. I adored. I have... If I could show you this room that we're sitting in, all the animated uh, series as I have that you worked on. Well, I see the Joe stuff behind you. I'm very gratified by that. Thank you. Um, the studios you worked for, you worked obviously at Filmation, uh, mm -hmm. Starlight. I think it was Starlight. Uh, Sunbow. Starlight. Starlight. Yeah. Starbright. Star yeah. Um, that was a series at Filmations, uh, Sunlight and Starbright. Wow. Uh, that was one that that was the first script I sold, and the series never got on the air. They um, they had come up with a premise um, where they had two teen girls, uh, sisters, twin sisters, one who got her superpowers in the daytime, and the other who got her superpowers at night. And when they hired me to work on the show, uh, you know, I'm reading the Bible to it. And they said they're identical twin sisters. One's blonde, the other's brunette. And I went, eh, they're not identical then. They're fraternal. And I had to explain to them the difference between identical and fraternal twins. Uh, but anyway, they could never come up with enough ideas for the show. And so the show was was canceled before it even went into production. I don't think we we ever got more than four scripts and nobody was happy with any of the scripts. I I did try to introduce sex to Saturday morning with it though. I I pitched an idea to them where they're trying to catch a unicorn and one of the girls can't get anywhere close to the unicorn and the other girl captures it quite easily. And of course if you know your your medieval mythology the unicorn could only be captured by a virgin. So <laughs> Interesting. Uh, I'm also a, a twin, uh, mm -hmm. since you mentioned oh. twins. Uh, I could have helped them out with that show. I have a lot mm -hmm. of fun uh, ideas that twins are uh, uh, do in their childhood and lives and stuff like that. They probably could have used somebody like myself. We probably uh, could have, yes. <laughs> Uh, so you also worked on uh, uh, At Ruby Spears with Thunder of the Barbarian. You mm -hmm. worked at, uh, I guess, the Patty Freeling, which became Marvel Animation Studios. Yeah. You worked on Gem, which is a fantastic yeah. unsung animated series that doesn't get enough credit. Uh, but you've really done a lot of uh, series and you have a lot of credits. So I'm guessing you only did a couple episodes at each of these things that are on your credits list because it's a long list. Well, thank you. Um, in many cases, yes, because in many cases I, I came in as um, a, a freelancer and pitching ideas. And very typically a studio would have staff writers, but 
to flesh out, you know, to make sure they got all the work in on time and not put too much, you know, pressure on their staff, they would take freelance scripts. And I was I was lucky to enjoy uh, a good reputation for a while as as someone who could come up with interesting and innovative ideas. So I was able to pitch uh, a lot of series, work at a lot of them. I had I had a few people who were story editors who would call me up and say, you know, we need we need some help here. We're we're running, uh, you know, we're running dry on ideas. Can you come up with some things for us? And I was always delighted to help out. Uh, uh, I did a, I did everything from the little clowns of Happy Town to um, Inhumanoids to um, Bionic Six, uh, uh, Mighty Orbots. I I I took a swing at a lot of stuff. There we go. Yeah. Um, but then what gets us to our main meat and potatoes here? Uh, is you ended up on uh, my favorite show, uh, G.I. Joe. Uh, mm -hmm. You wrote five episodes and then edited four episodes for the 85, 86 year with Steve Gerber and um, Joe Bacall, I believe, yeah. uh, setting up uh, the 1986 season, uh, yeah. the 85 season. And you wrote uh, The Traitor. Uh, was a big one. That was a, a really good episode with Dusty, where yeah. they kind of tried to put him over to Cobra to try and infiltrate Cobra by uh, making him seem like he's disenfranchised with the U.S. Mm -hmm. government and so on and so forth. And that was an excellent episode. And Thank you. I know that you are very particular about trying to instill in even though it's kids watching this stuff and you have the sensors and you have the studios that are interfering in a lot of this stuff. I know you uh, specifically tried to instill some more maturity, some more, a level of mm -hmm. uh, not peril, but kind of uh, uh, more responsibility or uh, respectfulness in these storylines mm -hmm. where right. kids could pick up on it. Right. One of the things that that dissatisfied me in animation when I got into the field, um, and I, I am using Super Friends as an example. I'm not trashing anybody who enjoys Super Friends because Super Friends has their specific type of story. But a Super Friends story, you know, the Joker steals the Eiffel Tower. And I was always like, well, who? who's going to miss a meal because the Eiffel Tower has been stolen? Who's, you know, this is a grandiose crime that it really doesn't impact anybody's daily life. And, uh, you know, obviously, except for the, the, the concession owners at the, uh, at the Eiffel Tower. But I always thought that every story that we do, it has to be the most important story in some character's life. And, and granted, when you're doing, um, like Superman, I, I wrote a couple of episodes for the Ruby Spears version of Superman. Um, Superman has thousands of adventures, but in the stories I wrote, there was always one character, a, a supporting character, a villain, somebody. This was the most important thing that ever happens to them. And this is what I tried to bring when I was writing stories for Sunbow and when I was story editing them, that, that it it just couldn't be chasing around after stuff that brings you back to the same position. Somebody's life had to change uh, because of this in, in some shape, fashion, or form. They either had to come away with a different point of view, they had to mature, they had to change their idea on something, but somebody had to experience some major change in their life. Um, I... I story edited more than my name appears on in in these series. Uh, as a story editor, I have always held the position that it is it is not my place as the story editor to put my name on a script. And there are many scripts that I drastically rewrote, and more than a few that I did page one rewrites, just basically threw out what was turned in and redid something. And I never put my name on them because that, as I said, that was not my responsibility. My responsibility 
was to help writers develop stories for us that we could use. Um, I got onto G.I. Joe uh, because I knew Steve Gerber, who was the original story editor. And Steve and I go back all the way to Ruby Spears. We we started working together at Ruby Spears, became really good friends. Um, and when Steve left Ruby Spears, uh, he he went over to Sunbow. Um, and I can I'll I'll tell you in a moment. Uh, I'll backtrack a bit and tell you how all that came about in a way. But in any case, he was working on G.I. Joe. And I had seen the animated commercials for the G.I. Joe comic book on TV because to to do an end run around the Federal Communication Commission's ban on toy oriented shows, they first did G.I. Joe as a comic book so they could say, hey, it's not based on the toy. It's based on the comic book. And I got to say, Larry Hama wrote all the bios for the characters. Larry, I, I cannot give Larry enough credit we had such rich material to work with, thanks to Larry, because he really did a great job on it. Uh, the, the bios on the back of the cards, that's about like one third the length of the bios that, that Larry wrote for these characters. It was really condensed. And, you know, our, our uh, series Bible was this big, thick notebook that was the full things that Larry had written out. Larry did a great job. I mean, I, can't, I cannot praise Larry enough on this. But anyway, Steve got the gig. Um, I called Steve up and said, uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to be able to come in and pitch some stories to you. And he said, well, we're we're full up on staff right now. He said, but, you know, I know you were in the Army for six years. Would you mind taking a look at a couple of these and just giving me some feedback? Well, if you seen the original miniseries, you know, there's stuff in it that isn't quite accurate, you know, like... Um, jets swooping down and cutting tanks in half with their wingtips and the the chain of command was never never very clear a lot of things like that and ron friedman is is a good writer when it comes to characters and dialogue and stuff like that but i mean ron had put all of his military background way in the back of his memory and so the show didn't really reflect anything close to, to what the actual military was like. And Steve sent me a few scripts um, and I went through them and I just basically made some notes. I kind of clarified chains of command, ranks. Um, I, I tried to give it like a patina of, of uh, what it would be like to be in the military, military, you know, with terminology, stuff like this. And Steve contacted Sunbow and said, you know, we really ought to bring Buzz on as a, um, you know, technical advisor. He was in the Army. He understands this stuff. He'd be really good, you know, to help with that. And they said, well, we don't have anything in the budget for a technical advisor, but we could hire another, you know, staff writer. So Steve got me the gig as a staff writer on G.I. Joe. And almost immediately, I became his assistant story editor, even though I didn't officially get the title until much later in the series. But I was I was looking over scripts that other people were doing, and and at first just trying to keep the terminology and the the rank system and things like that in order. But bit by bit, Steve was letting me do more and more of the actual story editing. So by the end of the first season, I was I was uh, his assistant, officially his assistant story editor. And then with the second season, I was the story editor for the entire second season. Um, and again, as I said, I. It was never my belief that my name should ever appear on anybody else's script unless unless I pitched it with somebody like with Flint when uh, Flint Dilly, when we did a, a Transformers episode together, unless I actually pitched it with Flint and we were working on it together, my name never went on another person's script. Cool. Um, 
so then I believe you took over what 86 and that's yep. when we end up with the uh arise serpentor arise yeah. the origin yeah. of uh serpentor and right. the 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 new lineup of toys mm -hmm. kind of came in and uh that was that season and it was the setup for a lot of big things down the road yeah yeah what had happened was uh after Steve left at the end of the first season uh, I moved up the chain to to be the story editor for the second season. And I wanted to do an episode that explained the origin of Cobra, not in great detail, but gave some idea about it. And my idea was that there would have been this Karl Marx, Frederick Nietzsche-like character who had come up with the operating philosophy of Cobra. And he was angry at Cobra Commander because Cobra Commander took it and twisted it around. And it, it wasn't what this guy had espoused. But Cobra Commander has him locked up in this super secret prison because um, he doesn't want the guy undermining his command. He doesn't want him undermining what he's doing with Cobra. And in my story, this guy escapes and Cobra immediately halts all operations worldwide to go looking for him. And the Joes, they have no idea who this guy is or why he's important to Cobra. They only know if Cobra wants him, we got to get him first. So the, the story would have been this hunt for this guy and the Joes get him. And when they get him, they find out he's like the biggest pain in the ass in the world. And he's just, he's like obnoxious. Nobody likes him. And he escapes from the Joes and the Joes go, you know what? He's out there causing trouble for Cobra. We don't care. Let him go. And so I, I came up with this story idea and I I did a, a um, short premise on it. I pitched it to Sunbow and Sunbow came back and said, we love it. Go, go straight to script on it. Uh, only one thing, be sure to include the Cobra Emperor. And I said, the Cobra who? And they said, the Cobra Emperor. And I said, well, who's the Cobra Emperor? And they said, well, he's the guy who runs Cobra. And I said, no, he's not. We've we've just had an entire season where Cobra Commander has been the, the supreme leader of Cobra. If you had told us to give hints, there might be a bigger thing behind him or someone above him. We could have dropped in a few subtle hints and we could have gone either way. We could have either had somebody or not had somebody. But, you know, we can't now just introduce this character without explaining where he came from. And they go, hmm, you're right. OK, uh, come up with a couple of ideas. Now, this was my mistake because I came up with two ideas and I should have only come up with the one I liked and presented it to them. But the first idea, the one that I liked was that the rest of Cobra, frustrated at Cobra Commander's incompetence, decides to create a new leader. And they do this by getting the DNA of all these great military leaders in the past and combining them and producing Serpentor. So that was the, that was the idea I wanted to do. But to give um, Hasbro and Sunbro, Sunbow another option, I said the other possibility is that there is a super secret organization, some lost civilization somewhere that has been secretly funding Cobra and they're angry at Cobra commander for not being successful and they send someone to replace him. And, you know, Sunbow calls me back and says, love it, do it. And I said, do which one? And they said, both of them. <laughs> so um, that pretty much put the torpedo into um, the most dangerous man in the world, because obviously if you've got this super secret organization, you're not going to have your Karl Marx, Frederick Nietzsche character running around loose. So I had to abandon the idea for the most dangerous man in the world, though years later, um, when Amazon was doing what they called the Kindle Worlds um, program, Kindle Worlds was basically a way to write fan fiction about your favorite fictional universes and actually get paid for it. Oh. And um, they had, oh, they had dozens of um, um, fan universes that you could participate in. Everything from, from romance series to mysteries to superheroes, science fiction. Wow. 
it was just tons of stuff that you could have you could write fan fiction for if you wanted and gi joe was among the list and i just thought to myself you know i always wanted to tell this story i was really enthusiastic about it so i wrote up a, a short novel called the most dangerous man in the world and it it was published uh through kindle worlds for about eight to nine months if i remember correctly i'm i'm don't don't hold me to that. I might be wrong, but it was it was only for a relatively short period of time, and then the Ki the Kindle Worlds program was abruptly closed, oh. and uh, they shut everything down, and they returned the rights to the books back to everybody who wrote them. So um, I've had a number of people ask me, "says Would, Wouldn't you like to see this done as a graphic novel?" And I said, "Any." Anytime, you know, somebody wants to uh, to talk to me about it, I'll be happy to have that conversation. So, uh, yeah, if, it, if anybody wanted to do it as a graphic novel, you know, I'm available. Just talk. You know. Well, that's that's a uh, cool idea, because a lot of times a lot of comic book publishers will do weird stuff like this. Like yeah. uh, Dark Horse did uh, George Lucas Star Wars, the Star Wars, based on his original concept. And they yeah. did like an eight issue miniseries based on. Yeah. So there are weird stuff like that that can yeah. be published if you get the backing behind it. But yeah. now G.I. Joe is going to be handed off to, I think, Dreamwave or somebody, uh, yeah. Rod, uh, Robert Kirkman's company. Yeah. He's going to be doing G.I. Joe. Larry just announced that he's continuing yeah. with uh, G.I. Joe 301. So maybe that might be an opportunity for them. I'll to be, be. I will be delighted to talk to them. And if if uh, any of the fans want to write to those people and say, hey, you ought to talk to Buzz, go right ahead and do it. I mean, I'm I'm open to it. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, so that story, though, the, uh, uh, the the most dangerous man, that kind of seems like a sounds like a story that they did do the uh, the where's the viper, the viper. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Episode. Oh, very much. Yeah, that one. That's um, that's a funny story, because what what had happened was uh, Steve Gerber introduced it as a joke at lunch uh, <laughs> one week. And he said, we ought to do this story where a guy shows up, and, you know, where, we, where we're getting these, the Joes are getting these mysterious phone calls. I'm the Viper. I'm coming, you know, and the Joes respond to it in all sorts of ways. And then in the end, they discover I'm the Vindo Viper. I'm here to vipe the Vindos, you know. <laughs> and we all laughed at it. OK, and that's on a Tuesday. And on a Friday, we are desperate for a script. We need something in the hopper Monday. Wow. And uh, I think it was, correct me if I'm wrong, it, it, we either handed it off to David Weiss or someone else. I can't remember. But Steve basically called him and said, we we have got to have this thing done Monday. Can you deliver? And yeah, I'll I'll write it over the weekend. And it's it's been one of our most popular episodes because it's just so goofy. I mean, it's it's well, that was the nice thing about G.I. Joe. We had a wide range of types of stories we could do. We could do everything from hardcore adventure to, um, you know, kind of science fiction to comedy fantasy. to, you know, a few horror episodes. We we could do just about anything we wanted to do on that series. Yeah, it's true. You had all kinds of stuff on there. There was no end to uh, the different types of stories that you did do with G.I. Joe mm -hmm. because it's like a hundred and I don't know, 120 episodes or whatever. If I uh, can remember all uh, the whole run of it for the three or four years with all the miniseries and everything like that, that's a lot of episodes. Today, shows really don't get that. You know, you might get 13 episodes here, 13 episodes there. By the end of it, they might have 35 episodes. You know, a lot of the shows today are not like they did back in the day the, the animation studios back in the day they were like workhorses oh you know, my god uh, uh, 130 yeah. episodes of thundercats 160 episodes of masters of the universe not including she-ra and all the specials and movies they did you know these shows went forever back in the day nowadays oh. you're lucky if you get a, a show that goes for two years that might get 30 episodes we we had at our high water mark something in the neighborhood of like 180 episodes that had to be done for a single season of Transformers, G.I. Joe, um, Jim, Jim, My Little Pony. Jim came a little later, but it, but at one point, 
we had like over 180 episodes that had to be done in one year's time. Wow. And we didn't have 365 days to do it. We we had to compress this into just a few months. And the analogy that I, I give to people is you have to imagine it's like a freight train moving by the station. And every day there's an open box car that comes by and you've got to throw something inside. You, you do not have the option of not throwing something into that boxcar. And uh, every day something goes in the boxcar. And if it's it, it has to be complete. And if it's good, so much the better. But it has to be complete. No. So after the 86 season and the rise of Serpentor, your second idea obviously uh, came about. Ron Freeman worked this over with Steve Gerber, but the studio and the people uh, at Hasbro weren't too keen on their uh, work on it, and they scrapped it, and I believe you took over it and created a whole new idea and a whole right. new plan. Right. Um, Ron gets the credit in the movie, and I, I am not irked at that because Ron had a really good agent who got him uh, um, a guarantee of, of exactly... Ron's agent got him a guarantee of sole screen by credit on anything he worked on. And, you know, good for Ron. He had a great agent working for him. Um, if this had been covered by Writers Guild, there would have been an arbitration and we would have, you know, decided whose name would be on it. Ron's name would have been on the script because he was the first writer on it. But um, Hasbro and Sunbo sent me the, the script. They said, we have some problems with this. Will you, will you come out to New York and talk with us about it? And, uh, you know, they, they were pretty quick. I, I seem to recall they, they sent me the script. And then the next day I was on the, on the airplane flying to meet them. And I read the script on the airplane uh, heading to the meeting. And when we got to the meeting, um, the just about the first thing they asked me was, well, well, what do you think about the script? And I said, to be brutally honest, uh, I think you ought to scrap it and just start from scratch. It'll be faster than trying to fix it. And they said, well, that's pretty much the conclusion we had come to, too. We are, we are just glad that, you know, you had the, the same point of view. Uh, and so they asked, would you come up with something? And so we we discussed some specifics, but it was pretty obvious it was going to be the lost civilization idea that I had had uh, pitched as an alternative to, um, um, you know, what became Arise Serpentor Arise. And they sent me back and I started working on it and putting the script together. Um, I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, we... Um, we were working under um, an agreement with uh, Dino De Laurentiis Productions. And what had happened, if I remember correctly, was Dino De Laurentiis was going to distribute the movie for us. And he promised he could get us five weekend screening, five screenings every weekend. Uh, you know, it was, we recognized it was going to be, all of these films were going to be, um, sold as kid films so we were we were all right with that we were used to that idea but he had promised us three screenings on a saturday and two on a sunday so that you would have five every weekend and he wasn't able to deliver that he was only able to deliver two on saturday and one on sunday and hasbro you know uh, got into a big argument with dino de Laurentiis, uh, and they they canceled uh they canceled G.I. Joe the movie, uh, the My Little Pony movie and the Transformers movie got released, but the G.I. Joe movie didn't get released theatrically. Uh, later on, they told me, they said they realized that they had released them in the wrong order, that the G.I. Joe movie should have been the first one to come out the gate, then Transformers, and then, you know, My Little Pony at the end of the summer. But you know, you live and you learn with these things. You have to uh, to find out by experience what's the best scheduling. That's interesting because I've always been under the understanding that they canceled the uh, G.I. Joe, uh, the animated feature film, because of the parents 
and kids outrage over Transformers, the uh, animated feature film in 86 of the death of Optimus Prime, and they didn't want to have a duplicate uh, situation where the parents were boycotting, the kids were not buying the toys, blah, blah, blah. And that's why the whole thing with Duke, where they changed the ending. Uh, uh, Duke is alive! And everybody's yeah. cheering, cheering. I thought that was the reason why that, that movie got put to uh, weekdays uh, along with the other cartoons. It didn't. It it wasn't the reason. It was it was a dispute with Dino De Laurentiis over the distribution. Um they did, though, however, change uh, the the ending and they changed the scene where he gets killed. I mean, I, I killed Duke dead. I mean, come on. I, I, I stab him through the heart with a poisonous reptile. How dead can you get somebody? Uh, but, um, uh, yeah, they they had a problem because uh, you, you, you have to understand each of these films was targeted at a different age group. Obviously, the My Little Pony movie, that's younger kids, okay? And younger kids have to go to the theater with their parents, and I'm sure the parents are sitting there wondering, well, what the hell is this all about? But at least it's bright and it's colorful and it's not really scary, and, and the kids are having a good time with it. I pity the poor parents who went with their kids to the Transformers movie because the Transformers audience, the the target audience was nine years old. So I can imagine you've got all these parents. They're in. Um, there we go. All these parents are in the theater with their kids. They are watching a movie that to them is like an acid flashback to the 1960s. You've got robots that are suddenly turning into cars and then into airplanes and all. And then the dialogue, it might as well be in high Martian because they can't understand anything that's going on. It's just this riot of noise and color and music. And then all of a sudden, all the kids start screaming and weeping. And the parents are going, what, what, what happened, what? <laughs> I killed Optimus Prime, you know. And I had told Hasbro when they were planning to do this, I said, you you can't kill a robot. The nice thing about a robot is you can blow it up, you can crush it, you can run it over with a steamroller, chop it into little bits, and you can always fix it and put it back good as new. I had been campaigning to kill somebody in the G.I. Joe movie. Because I said, look, we've been doing this series for two years. We've made allusions to casualties. We've never actually come out and killed anybody. You wouldn't let us kill anybody on the TV show. You've got these characters, Duke and several others that you want to get, you know, move out of the product line. Let's kill Duke off. Let him die a heroic death in the movie. And the G.I. Joe audience is 12 years old, so they can go to the movies by themselves. And on top of that, at age 12, intellectually, you realize in a war, people can get killed. You know, it might upset you, but at age 12, it is not going to be the shocker that Optimus Prime getting killed was. Well... You know, Transformer movie comes out, and yeah, we had we had a freak out reaction like nobody's business. Uh, reportedly, some kid locked himself in a closet for a couple of days. He was so heartbroken over it, and they they just changed everything about the GI Joe movie. And I I kept saying you can leave Duke's death in. You know, it, the audience will accept it. Yeah. Probably just as well they changed it because one of the things they learned from the G.I. Joe movie was how strong the following was for their core characters. They thought at the time they could just rotate characters through and people would just, you know, gravitate to whoever the new characters were. But no, once you've once you've introduced your core, they develop fans and the fans want to see them in every new episode. They don't want to have them replaced by other characters. This was actually kind of a new thing in the late eighties. Really? This didn't exist. Uh, yeah. You were a fan of cartoons like Plaza Man, Thundar. You were because they never, they never really died. They had uh, dilemmas they had to get out of He-Man even, you know, he had to get out of these dilemmas, Superman, <laughs> Batman, they had to get out of dilemmas and they were risky situations, but you knew it was the core character title character. They weren't going to die, you know, <laughs> but 
with Transformers, I think from Hasbro's perspective, and you can speak to this more than myself, but after 40 years of watching and reading and learning about this stuff, Hasbro didn't really know the property. Yeah, it was a toy property. They wanted to move one uh, seasons of toys out and put another seasons of toys in. But obviously they were doing it very clunkily. And Transformers, when you mow down about 10 guys in front of all this audience of children, that's mm -hmm. not a very smart way of telling a story for your audience that was a mature audience. And now right. you could say today's audience are much more mature than they were when I was a, a preteen, I guess you could call me, from 11 to 14, preteen is when those movies were coming out. Um, uh, we use that term now, but we didn't then. We just said, oh, that's a kid's movie. That's a kid's movie. Yeah. And so that was difficult uh, to watch. But I was mature enough to understand it's a cartoon. They're going to bring him back in the yeah. next season. And they did eventually bring him back. Spoilers for who's, whoever's watching this. The Optimus Prime did come back from the dead. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I've, I've got to say, I, I have yeah, ever... I forget who did it first. It was probably E.T. But when they started bringing characters back from the dead, when Obi-Wan Kenobi shows up as a ghost, when, um, you know, Spock is reincarnated, when all of these things are, they completely ruined the idea that death meant something. Um, you know, you know, they undermined it. You're right. Exactly. Yeah, they undermined it. I mean, I I, I like Terry Gilliam's version of Baron Munchausen because you're watching it and it ends with this tragic, tragic scene and everybody's weeping at his death. And then it cuts to Baron Munchausen and sa saying, and that was just one of three times that I died. <laughs> and, you know, of course, he's a liar. He he inflates everything he's done. It's it's a joke in the story, but uh, you know you can't. I I I really dislike the cheap resurrection uh, trope that it, that everybody seems to be going for, and I I really hope I really wish people would stop using it. I can't remember who said it. It may have been uh, Roy Thomas, but someone at Marvel once observed in comics. They're only dead if you have a body, and even then, only maybe. And that's true. I'm a huge comic book uh, collector since six years old till now. And, yeah. and I was just about to say the same thing. I said, a lot of these guys, Steve Gerber, and a lot of these people that were writing, uh, um, Marv Wolfman, uh, Paul Dini, Straczynski, mm -hmm. all these guys came from the comic world and animation as well. So they're going to, they're, they're, Mm -hmm. skills from writing comics are going to overlap into into animation yes it was more mature you use much more mature themes in the c cartoons and stuff like that but there's only so much that the censors and the the studios and hasbro was gonna uh, allow you yep. really did a good job i've got to uh, uh say with the movie uh judge of the animated feature uh movie i can't say feature film anymore because it was never in the th well no yes it was it was just in the theater a couple months ago and i saw it right. for the first time on the big screen and i wanted to bring that up but i i digress i'm going to go back to my other thought where you had like uh and i've read articles where you've talked about where you wanted uh these characters to have some sort of a level of uh um maturity the mm -hmm. situation with falcon uh falcon and his yep. dropping the ball and the whole thing with uh corporate commander being redeemed at the end and all these themes that as a child you don't get this stuff. Yeah, I read Chronicles of Narnia, I read Lord of the Rings, and that stuff as a child, and Wizard of Oz and stuff like that. But it's not as visceral as it is on a cartoon that I'm watching daily, Saturday morning, weekdays, and all that. Yeah, we we all had grown up with classic kid, kid literature, with Alice in Wonderland, Wizard of Oz, um, Narnia. Um, here's a series many of your your fans may never have heard of the the wonderful mushroom planet, which was about some boys who built a spaceship in their backyard and visit a brand new planet. Uh, 
we grew up with these things. This was we we understood kid adventure. We knew what kids liked. And when I was a kid myself, um, I I loved Donald Duck comics. Uh, I loved Scrooge McDuck comics. Carl Barks wrote great stories, and he wrote stories that had adventure and uh, pathos in them. And and you know the characters had rich emotional lives, and and they're talking ducks, but he made them come alive. You you forgot about the fact they were ducks, and you were just focused on the story on how much how much uh they were enjoyable in you fact i've had people yeah you yeah wrote some in the 90s right yeah i did i, I was so happy i mean it was uh, i finally got a chance to write donald duck and scrooge mcduck uh but i've had people ask me what what do i think is the greatest graphic novel of all time and i tell them it's carl barks's a christmas for shacktown which is a scrooge mcduck story he did it's like i think 48 pages i may be wrong but it's been reprinted again and again, and it is just a great story. And it's it's a Scrooge McDuck story, but it is just perfect. It's just wonderful. And I grew up with that. I grew up with um, Bob Bowling's uh, Little Archie series. Now, now some of the younger um, fans may not be aware of this, but in the in the 1960s. Uh, Archie Comics did a preteen version of Archie called Little Archie. And since you couldn't have romance and uh, dating and stuff going on with the characters as, you know, preteen kids, they got involved in adventures and mysteries. And all of those stories were a lot of fun. I mean, so there was a there was an enormous amount of good material for kids. And Steve and myself and and everybody working on on Transformers and GI Joe and at Ruby Spears, um, we were all acutely aware of this, and we were all trying to uh, not imitate but recreate that sense of wonder that we encountered when we were kids. The uh, Young Archies wasn't that an animated series in the eighties as well? You know, I think there was a Young Archie series. I don't think i ever watched it um i i i was at ruby spears where ruby spears for about like 15 minutes had the rights to archie's and nothing happened of it and i remember their version primarily was uh they were inspired by uh michael jackson's thriller and archie's wearing michael jackson's red jacket and they're all dancing like thriller and oh. i that was a weird time at Ruby Spears. <laughs> if I may, let me, because I, I, I hinted at this. Sure. Let me backtrack a bit so that uh, your viewers can understand the evolution of, of TV animation. Okay. TV animation started out as cartoons that would sell products. Okay. And they were, Saturday morning was typically when they would be shown. But you also had local stations that would run blocks of like Warner Brothers or Betty Boop cartoons. And you also had a few uh, original syndicated cartoons, uh, very low budget, uh, like Crusader Rabbit, um, uh, Beanie and Cecil and uh, Bullwinkle. OK, so. There was a market out there for new animation for, for kids in the 50s and 60s. And they would they would get inspiration from anywhere and everywhere. I mean, they you look at some of these old shows and, and some of them are based on old radio programs. Some of them are based on, on uh, books and magazines. But there wasn't any rule at the time that said they couldn't be based on toys. And in the 1960s, um, Hanna-Barbera had a Hot Wheels uh, TV show. And parents complained to the FCC. They said this is basically just a half hour cartoon for Hot Wheels. And it didn't matter how well it was done. I mean, I got to give credit. Um, the the comic book, the Hot Wheels comic book was drawn by this incredible artist, a guy named Alex Toth, and he, beautiful art, 
good stories, solid stories. Uh, I, I can't remember the TV series, but the fact that they they have cars that are referred to as Hot Wheels, that's incidental. The, the stories were focused on something else. But the parents complained about it, and the FCC came back with a ruling that said you cannot have toy-based shows. You can have shows based on movies, on pre-existing literary properties, comic books, but you can't have them based on toys. So jump ahead about five or six years. Um, the Smurfs are introduced to America as toys. And uh, people have no idea, but for about two years, these little tiny blue figures were everywhere. Nobody knew what they were, but they were popular. People were buying them. They were on keychains. They were good luck tokens. And again, uh, Hanna-Barbera wanted to do a TV series based on them, but they said, well, we can't do it because they're toys. And one of their animators said, well, it's based on a Belgian comic book. And they go, oh, really? So they pitched the show and the network, I, I forget who it was. It may have been NBC. Uh, the network puts it on. The FCC says, hey, you can't do it. It's based on a toy. And they said, no, it's not. Here's the Belgian comic book. And the FCC goes, well, OK, you're right. You know, it was never published in the United States, but it was a pre-existing property, literary property. You can do that. Well, then the uh, strawberry shortcake people say, well, does do greeting cards count as original properties? <laughs> and the FCC goes, mm, it's printed material. Yeah, technically, that's a pre-existing literary property. So they said, great, Strawberry Shortcake started out as greeting cards before it became a toy line. And so they, they did the uh, Strawberry Shortcake specials, which were insanely popular. At that point, Hasbro and Mattel both approached animation studios with um, Mattel had He-Man and Hasbro had um, Transformers, and they were looking for people to work with them. And Mattel made a deal with DC Comics to do a three-part miniseries called He-Man and the Masters of the Universe that bears absolutely no resemblance to the TV show. But they just had to get the name and the character likenesses out there. And once they did that, they could do whatever they wanted with the TV show. Conversely, Hasbro um, after they acquired the rights to these Transformer toys from Japan, um, they they hired Marvel to do uh, a comic book based on them so they could say, hey, we're not doing it on toys. We're doing it based on the comic book. Likewise with G.I. Joe, they, they knew what they wanted to do with the toys, but they go to Marvel first before the toys are introduced so that Marvel can beat beat the toys to the marketplace by a few months and they can say G.I. Joe was a comic book first. So after that, that pretty much was the point where the FCC just said, OK, you can do toy based shows now. Now, that changed the industry in this way. Up until that point, the, the networks were where most people were trying to sell shows. There were a few syndicated shows, not a lot, but there were a few original syndicated shows. And the way syndication worked uh, was instead of the, the stations paying to run the series, the people syndicating it would say, we'll give you the series for free, but we want half the advertising time. We'll sell the advertising time to someone else but you can have the series for free. So if you had a 22 minute, if you had a half hour quote unquote episode, that's really only 22 minutes of animation. That gives you four minutes that you can sell commercials in. They were basically sell it, saying, you can have two minutes for local commercials. We want two minutes for national commercials. And a lot of TV stations, because they've got budgets, they're trying to stretch their dollars. They were going, yeah, sure, we'll, we will run, it was called the barter system. We will run your programming for free and we'll give you half the animate, we'll give you half the commercial time, 
because, you know, um, two minutes that we can sell without having to pay for programming is better than paying for programming and having, you know, four minutes or eight minutes to sell. Well, the toy companies, when they were promoting their toy series, they would be advertising other toys made by the same company during the show. So for G.I. Joe, we would be advertising My Little Pony, Gem, Inhumanoids, uh, Transformers. Transformers, they would advertise everything except Transformers. So you wouldn't have the commercial for the show you were watching, but you would have the commercial for the show that came on right after. So this was how the the marketing worked. And that shifted everything away from um, network shows into the syndication market because the toy companies were, were spending enormous amounts of money to get high quality animation so that they could barter with the local stations. Uh, previously, if, if a network bought a show, Thundar is a good example. If the network bought Thundar, it might cost $600,000 to do an episode. The network would only pay Ruby Spears about four hundred, five hundred thousand 500000 for each episode. So they had to do what was called negative financing. They had to borrow money to do the episode and then hope they had enough episodes at the end of the season that they could syndicate it locally and that people would would buy the show and put it on the air because that was the other way. Instead of bartering, you would put the show out there and people would buy it, uh, you know, lease it rather, and would run it locally, but they would run all the commercials would be local commercials. Well, with the barter system, that destroyed uh, what they call negative financing. So there was less and less interest in doing quality work for Saturday morning shows. The networks, they realized kids aren't watching us on Saturday morning. They're watching independent channels that are getting all of these higher quality animated shows under the barter system. On top of that, the, you know, they made much more money with sports on weekends than they did with kids programming. They had kids programming because the FCC required them when they, in the 40s and 50s, the FCC required a certain amount of time to be set aside for children's programming and for um, public interest programming. That's why, for those of you who are my age, you remember on Sunday mornings, you know, you would have all the uh, talking head shows, all the shows about art and culture and politics and stuff like that. They'd point to this stuff on Saturday morning that nobody was watching and say, well, see, we're, we're doing shows about cultural events on, sa on Sunday mornings. Once the um, uh, cable world took off, once cable television arrived, and once the barter system got in place, that was the end of that. I mean, the FCC just said, well, now there's, there's an infinite number of channels. There's an infinite number of selections. The networks are no longer required to run these shows for kids. And the network said, well, what, what do we want to sell stuff to kids for when we can sell it to adults, you know, sports shows? And that was the end of Saturday morning animation. Now, with streaming, uh, even the cable networks are drying up because people, by and large, don't want to subscribe to a network. Um, unless they can access it anytime they want to. So nobody wants to subscribe to, um, you know, any of the classic super stations. There were like three or four super stations in the USA, 70s and 80s. TNT, yeah. TBS. Yeah. And they... Odeon. They were all over um, the country. I mean, even, even like... Um, WTBS and TNT were both out of Atlanta and they were in every market in the United States because they were they were getting programming that the networks couldn't get. And the thing was, it was scheduled. You had to tune in at a certain time to watch it. Well, once streaming became viable, 
you know, you didn't have to tune in to watch it. So now the interesting thing is we're seeing commercial television coming back because there's in, there's a large number of free streaming services that put the commercials back in shows. You know, uh, you you're watching and a commercial pops up, but you you're thinking, well, you know, I'm watching it at my convenience when I want to. I'll put up with the commercial. I'll go to the bathroom. I'll I'll get a a drink of water or something. Um, so it's completely destroyed the old way of everybody had to watch at a certain time um, and only in the sequence that the, the networks were showing. So once again, I'll back up. I, I was in the seventies and early eighties, I was considered the giant robot bug in animation because I was familiar with all of these giant robot shows that were being done in Japan. And they were, they had a much higher quality of writing and voice acting and characterization than, than we had in our shows. Yeah. They, they were about complex real issues that, that, you know, people face. And I kept trying, I kept trying to convince every studio I worked for, we, we really ought to develop a giant robot show. Cause once, once giant robots hit, they're going to be huge. They're going to be big. Every, every kid in America is going to want one. You ought to get in front of the, the curve now. And everybody dismissed me, buzz, you're a crackpot. Shut up, go away. Well, I'm working at Ruby Spears and Joe Ruby calls us into a meeting with these guys from Hasbro and they've got a suitcase and they open up the suitcase and it is filled with transforming robot toys. They, the Japanese had several transforming robot series and Hasbro had bought the license to those toys and they were going to bring them to the United States. They were going to repaint them, rename them. They were, they weren't going to bring the series over, but they were going to recreate the, the toys with new characters, new names um, their brilliant move was to save about 50 cents on each toy. They got rid of the pilot, you know, because most of these toys, there was a pilot figure in there. The hero of the show would be driving the robot. They said, well, we'll just get rid of the hero and the robots will be autonomous. They'll be their own characters. They won't be machines that are driven around, which was really smart because it, it turned the robots into characters, not just vehicles. Uh, anyway, they open this up and it is filled with transforming robot toys. And they had been going to literally every animation studio in Hollywood looking for someone who wanted to produce this series for them. And it was all I could do to keep, you know, from bursting out in the middle of the meeting. And as soon as they were gone, I said, Joe, we have got to get this series. This is going to be great. It's going to be big. It's going to be huge. Whatever you do, don't let this get away. Get this series. And Joe went, nah, I got a better idea. We're going to do a show about a teenage boy who turns into a car. <laughs> and uh, he created this show called Turbo Team. I don't remember that. That was pretty cheesy. Yeah, it, it was. It, it was. It was a show. It was a wild show. I was on it for about 15 minutes and uh, Joe realized, eh, no, this is not the show for Buzz. And he moved me to something else. But in any case, after I left um, Ruby Spears and uh, eventually ended up at Sunbow, um, I'm in one office working on G.I. Joe, other people across the hall, Flint Dilly and others, they're working on Transformers. But the time schedule was so intense that frequently we would switch over. And, you know, they'd say, hey, we're we're two scripts down this week. We need to have a couple of scripts done. Can you write a Transformers really fast for us? Yeah, sure. You sit down and you knock one out as fast as you can. Uh, I did. I think my name is on like three Transformers scripts that I wrote either by myself or in conjunction with Flint. Um, but there are other Transformers episodes where unofficially I did rewrites on them, um, you know, things like that. Again, I, I'm a story editor. It is not my place to put my name on somebody else's script. Um, would that every story editor had that, um, uh, you know, standard. But 
I got to work on Transformers. I finally got to do some of the giant robot stuff I had wanted to do. Um, we did Inhumanoids. We did Gem. Uh, we did My Little Pony, which we all enjoyed because, you know, after a while, you just get tired of punching the crap out of people and you go, ah, can I do something a little different? Yeah, go go write a couple of My Little Ponies. Get a, get that out of your system. Oh, good. All right. I can relax. You know, we don't have to, you know, save the world and blow things up every episode. So it was a lot of fun working there. It was a, it was a tremendous. It was the best experience, working experience in my life. What? Well, it shows from your enthusiasm in this interview and stuff like that. And like I said, I've read uh, articles uh, uh, that you've uh, been involved with and stuff. And I, I see that you love uh, the work that you're doing. Obviously, you have to love what you're doing. If if you don't, you're just going to be trudging in to work every day. And it's going to be like, uh, all right, I'll mm -hmm. do it. But, you know, yeah. there's no enthusiasm. There's no uh, passion for the uh, stuff like that. And I can see that uh, definitely with you. And uh, a lot of the stuff that was in the 80s, even the people working on G.I. Joe and the toy lines and a lot of the other programs, you can see people love those projects. Uh, I've spoken to uh, Peter Cullen and Frank Welker at conventions and stuff. Mm -hmm. They loved it. It was fun. You could see oh, that yeah. they were enjoying themselves doing this. And um, there was a lot of cool stuff in the 80s. I, I, if that's the one thing I wish it, if I had a time machine, I would go back to the 80s and just relive my childhood, maybe from the late 70s to like the early 90s. That would be my like universal time frame. I wouldn't want to uh, get out of that because there's so much stuff. Not only film uh, was fantastic in those uh, years, toys, animation, mm -hmm. just life in general. We weren't trying to blow each other up for one thing either. <laughs> well, I, I lived through that period. We got, we had some pretty scary moments. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you remember the time that Reagan joking over a microphone, he was doing a sound check and he didn't realize he was being broadcasted when he did the sound check. And he announced that he had just passed legislation to outlaw Russia and the missiles were on their way. And this is broadcast live. Oh my God. <laughs> so, you know, and and luckily everybody realized they could hear in his tone of voice, he's joking. You know, he was laughing as he said it. But I mean, it scared the hell out of people. And, you know, after that, they had to be a lot more careful about what they said around microphones, you know, so. Well, you know, today's society is a completely different society than it was in the 80s and stuff. Thankfully, uh, that didn't happen today because he would have been boop, he, uh, uh, booted out immediately if he had said something like that uh, in office. I, I do not know that to be a fact today. I, I see things happening and I say to myself, really, you're you're not going to recognize this is the this is the step too far. This is where we've got to say no. That's wrong. Pull it back. And we have people encouraging people to do things that you, you want to tell them this really isn't the thing to do. And yet, well, you know, we, we like it because it makes the other side angry. You, you need to have policies that are based on positive things the policies will do, not on making other people angry. And you know, we can we can argue about specifics of policy. You know, one one thinks it should be at this level. One thinks it should be at that level. OK, we can talk here about where the level should be. But when you have one person say, well, we've got to do this because we have a problem. And the other side says, no, we're not going to do anything at all because we're just going to show you we don't care. That makes things worse. You've you've got to come to terms with one another. And so I don't want to get any more specific than yeah, that. So no. I'll, I'll let it go with that. No, no. You have to work together uh, to resolve mm -hmm. common uh, common issues and things like that. And that's what the pi part, bipartisan si si system is supposed to be yeah. there for. But there is not a bipartisan system any longer. Yeah. And one of the things about Sunbow and, and before Sunbow, uh, Ruby Spears, we had a really diverse group of people and points of view working on those shows. And one of the reasons that the episodes stayed fresh was that people working on them came from a variety of backgrounds with a variety of opinions. 
a variety of ideas. And as a result, we never got into a rut. We never got where we were doing the same thing over and over again, which, uh, you know, for a lot of the um, Saturday morning shows, because of network interference, it became the super friend problem again. And again, I'm not trashing anybody who loves super friends. Please don't misunderstand me. But because of network restrictions, there was only so much you could do with super friends. You know, you're not you're not going to get the dark night from super friends. No. They got no. better. They got better as it went along. That last season, season 10 and season nine were probably the two, in my opinion, as a kid growing up. And I watched the entire thing. Uh, I think they got better as it got uh, further along from that uh, that formulaic you know you can't hurt yeah. anybody can't touch anybody can't do this can't do that no lasers no this no. it got better yeah. as it went along but yeah that early stuff was really bad <laughs> yeah they used to have uh, there used to be ridiculous restrictions in uh animation on on networks um i can't believe but, i heard i read this uh, about uh, that you talked about this and this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard because you can't even imagine G.I. Joe without this that they didn't want to use lasers why in the world would they tell you don't use lasers on a cartoon show that's they're using guns they're using weapons they're fighting in a war type scenario how the heck are they going to fight each other and I think you said that I I yeah, they they ended up having the lasers were used by default because, as they pointed out, well, the the alternative is uh, using actual machine guns with against each other, and I think it finally sank in on on somebody. Yeah, we we weapons are lasers are fanciful weapons. the The argument always came back to this imitatable violence, and. And I have to say, this is a legitimate issue to bring up. They didn't want to show the kids anything that a kid could possibly do at home. So if if you have a character smack another character over the head with a bottle, a kid could go into the kitchen and get a bottle and smack somebody over the head with it. And and in real life, a bottle will fracture your skull if it's hit, if it hits you hard enough. Uh, you couldn't, they didn't want characters being assaulted with knives because yeah, a kid could get a knife. And even if the kid wasn't stabbing at another kid, the kid could hurt himself playing with a real knife. So there was a legitimate concern. Don't do anything a kid could imitate easily. And because so many households have firearms in them, there was a real pressure. Don't, have guns firing randomly. Now, if you've seen really old 1950s, 1960s cartoons, um, you'll see characters chasing each other with, you know, flintlock shotguns and things like that, blasting away, shooting each other in the seat of the pants, stuff like this. And you look at it and go, well, yeah, I mean, these are you know, these are bears, these are ducks, these are not human characters. It's not a realistic story. Um, they get blown up, and then in the next episode, they're fine. Not even in the next episode, in the next scene, they're fine. It's like the coyote. I mean, every everything that happens to the coyote in real life would kill the coyote. But the coyote, you know, no matter how badly mangled he is at the end of one gag, in the next one, he's in perfect condition. And so people were saying kids can understand the difference. But there was a legitimate concern that as you were starting to do more realistic cartoons like Johnny Quest, um, you know, action adventure cartoons, things like this, you didn't want to create scenarios where a child might think in, in, in wanting to imitate it, to play like it, to grab a real object, you know, and, and smack somebody with it. So there was a tremendous amount of pressure to deal, to get rid of firearms entirely. 
I didn't work on the Lone Ranger show at Filmation, but they wanted to get rid of the the gun and the silver bullets. And it was like, that's kind of like key to the Lone Ranger's, that's his, that's his trademark. And so they let them keep the, they let the Lone Ranger keep his gun, but he could only use it to shoot inanimate objects. So the Lone Ranger, to stop a stampede of buffalo, he he would aim at a boulder in the canyon, and he'd shoot at the boulder, and the boulder would come ro rolling down and start an avalanche, and it would block the buffalo. He could do that. He couldn't take a shoot uh, a shot at a real person. He couldn't even threaten to shoot a real person with the gun. And they had a lot of restrictions like that, and and they went overboard because a show like um, Scooby Doo, where you're talking, even though the the um, even though the criminal is using a pretty far fetched means to commit the crime, the crime is is realistic. Uh, they're trying to chase somebody off the land so they can get the treasure that's buried there. They're trying to scare somebody away so they can take over something. The crimes all had rational, real-world parallels. You could you you go, yeah, I can understand somebody would try to do that. It's not they're not stealing the Eiffel Tower. They're trying to to enrich themselves by committing a crime. And in shows like that, you'd think, well. If you had a villain threatening somebody with a gun or something like that, you'd go, yeah, that's in context. It's This is a crime show. Networks didn't see it that way. Um, G.I. Joe could never have been done on the network. Transformers couldn't have been done on a network. Um, Even though you never, they never hit anything. <laughs> yeah. We did Thundar the Barbarian. And we had a long list of things that we could and couldn't hit with that sun sword. And basically it boiled down to as long as it was a non-living thing, we could, we could destroy robots, we could destroy energy monsters, we could destroy muck monsters. We couldn't destroy zombies. If, if it had once been alive and was now you know animated, we couldn't destroy it. But anything else we could destroy. And after the first season of Thundar, we got word from uh, ABC Program Practices. They said, we thought the first season was too violent, and we're going to cut way back on what we allow in the next season. And Joe said, I don't know how we're going to do this show if we can't have you know the action quality in it that we, we had. And I said, well, what we have to do is write a season opener that is so incredibly violent that no matter what they cut out, they still have to let a lot of stuff through. And then after that, we simply point to that one and say, well, you let us do this in the season opener. And then that gives us, you know, a way to, to keep the action in. And Joe said, well, who can write such a violent episode? And every eye in the room looked at me. <clears throat> and I wrote the, uh, the second season opener is called Wizard War. And Steve Gerber paid me a great compliment on it. He said I was the only person he knew of who could write a 45-page fight scene and not repeat himself once. And uh, I basically put everything I could into this. The, the story is basically two wizards are fighting each other. One wizard has robots, the other has muck monsters, and Thundar and uh, Ariel and Ookla are caught in the middle of it. And I was doing everything I possibly could. I was dropping robots into fans and having them shattered and the parts scattered all over the place. I was doing all kinds of stuff. Even Joe Ruby was horrified by it and cleaned it up before it went to the network. It went to the network and they practically had a coronary. And they went through and they redlined all of the stuff in it, but they left enough that it was still an action-packed episode. And after that, for the rest of the season... Whenever we were would push the envelope and they'd say, you can't do that, we'd say, well, you know, you let us do it in the season opener. <clears throat> and they would relent and let us do whatever it was we wanted. Now, the payoff to this is that for the next 17 years, I was the official bad example at ABC Program Practices. 
whenever they were going to hire a new person to be a censor, they would give them a copy of my script. And if they didn't find 50 things wrong with it, they didn't get the job. <laughs> That's funny. I've, I've read that about you. I read that you were the uh, difficult one there. Not difficult in that uh, sense. Oh, I was difficult. I was absolutely difficult. Yeah. <laughs> Joe Ruby, I, 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 I want to say this. Joe Ruby had the patience of a saint. I would have fired myself a dozen times over, but Joe kept me on. Uh, he was he and Ken were two nice, wonderful guys. Uh, they would always give me a fair hearing before telling me I was insane, but they would listen to whatever I had to say. Um, another thing, nice thing Steve Gerber said about me was that um, he said the first three ideas out of Buzz's mouth are going to horrify you. The fourth one is going to be gold. <laughs> and uh, that's my imagination was so vivid and I was willing to push things as far as I possibly could. And that was pretty much, you know, what I was notorious for. The, the first ideas, the first few ideas, they would horrify you. It was like, oh my God, we can't do that. And then the fourth one, you know, maybe we could work that one. But it, the fourth one would be something different you hadn't seen before. It would be approaching the material in a way that you hadn't thought about. And that's one of the reasons I guess Joe kept me on was that I could I could come up with stuff like this. The interesting thing I find ab about a lot of uh, television shows in the eighties, mm -hmm. uh, people don't give the eighties television credit the, where uh, where it deserves is they were a lot more diverse. They were a lot more inclusive. We use this woke and this inclusiveness stuff like it's going out of style today. But in the 80s, it was diverse. G.I. Joe is probably one of the most diverse uh, set of characters that you could possibly imagine. Uh, inclusive. All these girl TV shows that were on the air in the 80s, and stuff like that. I don't think there's hardly any girl TV shows today. I could maybe right. count maybe a couple, like the new She-Ra cartoon and a couple of really weird stuff on Cartoon Network. But they really covered all the bases in the 80s. And I don't think... 80s studios get the credit um ruby spears did barbie spider woman they did a lot of stuff in the 80s uh, well, even even before that um um filmation much to their credit tried to be as diverse as possible in their their stories um one of the first things that i wrote for them was a a series called tarzan and the super seven that had several different segments in it and we had uh, an African-American couple who were superheroes, Super Stretch and Micro Woman. We had uh, Hispanic characters in it. They were doing Fat Albert at the time, oh, yeah. which was Bill like Cosby. the first. Yeah, the first. Yeah, before people knew about Bill Cosby. Um, it was the first animated series, primarily African-American animated series ever. We tried working, um, uh, you know, mixed casts in not just ethnically mixed, but, uh, you know, male and female into, into our stories so that there would be that diversity. Uh, Ruby Spears, we had a show called Mr. T, based, you know, based on Mr. T. Yeah, that was a good show. We had, we had 17 regular cast members each one had to have at least one line of dialogue in every episode and so basically by the time every character had a chance to say one thing the episode was over <laughs> but it was a diverse cast and we you know we were uh, we were trying to be diverse ariel is um of asian heritage in in, Th in thundar um other shows we did where we had non-human characters, there would be something in the voices to indicate, you know, they weren't white bread type characters. They were from diverse backgrounds. Uh, G.I. Joe, obviously we had a lot of diverse characters in that. But even with um, shows like Transformers, you know, Scatman Crothers is doing jazz, okay? Um, My Little Pony, you... The idea was 
there should be representation for every member of your audience. And the great thing about having shows like Transformers and G.I. Joe and My Little Pony, where you had dozens of characters. I mean, at one time we counted, we had 84 regular characters in G.I. Joe at one point. The great thing about that was you didn't have to use every character in every episode. You could you could write a story and then say, who is the best character to tell this story? And so we could we could uh I'll give you an example, low light. Low light's a flipping sociopath, okay? He is he is not a nice character. He is a very scary person. And yet we were able to write a couple of episodes where low light figures into the story and figures in in a positive way because, well, this is the kind of story that would require low life, low light to tell it. If we tried to put low light in every episode, you know, at a certain point you're going, why are they associated with this guy? He's nuts. <laughs> but if you could, if you could say, you know, we don't need low life for this episode, low light for this episode. He can, he can be back at Joe headquarters, or he can be one of a dozen Joes jumping out of the truck and, you know, rushing into combat. We don't have to see him or hear from him in the episode. And that's what, what made it possible to write every kind of episode you wanted. There was always somebody who could tell the episode for you. Now, the thing about uh, uh, the 80s and even the, the late 70s, Filmation also did live action shows like um, Arc 7, uh, Space Academy, Jason uh, of Star Command, and there's Ghostbusters. And there were other TV shows and stuff like that. And they had diverse casts. It wasn't yep. just animation uh, shows that had the, the diverse cast. So obviously these studios just had the common sense. It's not like today where the parents would be up in arms. Oh, you didn't include this type of character. You didn't include that type of character. You didn't. I don't know if the parents wrote letters like they do uh, or emails or uh, pitchforks, the studios or whatever, like they do today. Back we, then, I we, didn't hear about it and I didn't have to uh, have those discussions with my mom and dad. I just watched the shows and I didn't have any issues. We, we got fan mail and we got hate mail and we oh. got uh, complaints about different things, oddball things. Um, Filmation had at the time probably the most inept lawyer of any studio I worked for. This guy got him sued by everybody. And there was a comic strip called Tumbleweeds, which was a satire on Wild West tropes. And I love Tumbleweeds. It was a very, very funny comic strip done by a guy named T.K. Ryan. And um, they got they were going to do tumbleweeds as a segment of a show called the fabulous funnies. And I, I just begged Lou. I said, let me Lou Scheimer, uh, who was the head of, of filmation. I said, you got to let me write this. I love this comic strip. I, I know how to write it. And he said, well, you can do it, but you can't include any native American characters. And I said, well, why not? And he said, because we would have to hire Native American voice actors, and we just don't have any money in the budget to hire Native American. They had they had a regular um, roster of voice actors. People familiar with the show know that Norm Prescott, the other uh, producer there, Norm provided voices and narration for God knows how many uh, uh, shows they did. But anyway, I said we don't we can't afford Native American voice actors. And I said, well, there are two characters who are mute, you know, Native American characters. They're mute. And uh, uh, I said, I can I can use them. And they said, great. You know, you can use those. So they they uh, they gave me permission to write those characters into the scripts. And I was going to we were only going to do four episodes because we didn't do we didn't do every set of characters in every episode. But we were going to do four uh tumbleweeds segments and i was going to write all four of them i wrote the first one and it aired on a sunday and on monday we got a phone call from tk ryan's lawyer saying he really liked the episode he's just wondering why you never got a contract with him 
because what had happened was Filmation's lawyer had contacted him and said, we'd, we'd love to do a TV show based on Tumbleweeds. And Ryan said, okay, send me a storyboard so I can see what you plan to do with the series. And if I like it, I'll say, okay. And the lawyer said, he said, okay. And yeah. never followed up. So we, we wrote and animated a show and got it on the air without his permission. And, um, you know, it got yanked immediately. Uh, you can find it on YouTube. You have to look for it. But, uh, um, you know, that was typical of, of what happened at Filmation at, in those days. They got sued by everybody. I'm not exaggerating. We got, we got simultaneously sued by DC and Marvel over the same characters. They sued us over Super Stretch and Micro Woman, and they sued us over Manta and Moray. DC said Super Stretch and Micro Woman were like Elastic Man and the Atom, and Manta and Moray were like Aquaman, and Marvel said Super Stretch is like Mr. Fantastic, Micro Woman is like Ant Man, and Manta and Moray are like Namor. And I told Lou, I said, you can't copyright a, I, I, uh, you can cover an intellectual property like Bob the Barber. That's your, your intellectual. Property. You cannot copyright a guy uh, that can move his hands by stretching. You can do whatever the hell you want to do as long as you call right. it something else. Look, I could, I told him this. I mean, I, I pointed out there was, um, there's a live action Sinbad movie did in, done in the late forties called Captain Sinbad, where a character, a wizard uses magic to extend his arm, um, you know, like 40, 50 feet to try to reach inside a room to get something. Um, you're right. But, um, he managed to lose to both of them. I said, you, you ought to tell them to go into a room and decide who is being ripped off and then we'll deal with the winner. So, you know, they just, uh, they were a mortar magnet for lawsuits. They got, they got sued over everything. But going back to the thing about parent groups. Yeah. There were a lot of people complaining at the time. There were a lot of groups, a lot of people who claim to represent far more people than they did. Um, there was this clown named Dr. Thomas Radecki. And he, when I say doctor, I, I, I don't think it was a legitimate doctor degree. I think it was one of these self-described things. But um, Radecki just, uh, he launched a campaign against uh, what he considered to be violent TV shows. And particularly cartoon shows. And it 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 didn't matter when we would try to say, you know, if we drop a safe on somebody and they come out from under it and they're making accordion noises as they squeak up and down and then they shake themselves and they're perfectly all right. We're not going to get kids dropping safes on people from the tops of buildings. Okay. <laughs> you know, uh, he could he could not fathom that. Um, but it was, look, a lot yeah. of the shows sorry to interrupt you a lot of the shows had the segments at the end of the shows G.I. Joe was no different they had the uh, the public PSAs or whatever to help yeah. the kids and I know this was to diffuse some of these issues oh, yeah. obviously yeah. but some of the, they didn't realize the audience wasn't idiots yeah, yeah I'm sure there are idiots out there because there are in every uh, culture in every age group there's an idiot but uh, yeah. kids were a little bit more savvy than uh the studios and the the uh, people gave us credit for they were they were uh hasbro only asked me once to develop psas for them they said you know we're, we're running out of ideas uh have any of you guys got any ideas for psas and i said well you know we're a military show so we ought to do some military oriented psas like we ought to do one. Kids, if you're going to make a Molotov cocktail, make sure there's some ground up soap in the bottom so it'll stick to the target when it hits. Ugh. And they go, yeah, we're not going to ask you for any more input. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. I, I mean, I worked, I, I, I worked stuff, jokes into um, and references into G.I. Joe that... Um, 
Um, I was surprised at the time I got away with and and uh, like in the trader, uh, if you pay attention, they they refer to Owsley Chemical Works and H.S. Thompson Pharmaceuticals, um, two drug references that went right over everybody's head. Well, um, that's the thing, know. though. That's yeah. the thing. When you even myself, I've watched this stuff recently as an adult. The references are there, but the kids don't know. Like in the first five part G.I. Joe miniseries, this uh, be careful, uh, viewers. This is not to insult anybody, but it's a reference to an episode. Uh, in G.I. Joe, the first five part, they call Torpedo Pedo in four or five parts. I'm like, ooh, I don't think I would be using yeah, that term yeah. in a kid's cartoon. <laughs> yeah, not 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 today. Yeah, there are there are phrases that uh but even back then that would have meant what it meant yeah yeah um i worked i worked a few gags in there's there's one where uh dr mindbender is trying to implant nightmares on the joes and um either scarlet or lady j is is saying in the morning yeah i i had this terrible light nightmare last night i dreamed i was singing the national anthem at the super bowl and someone asked her, well, what's so terrible about that? And she said, let's just say I was out of uniform. <laughs> and, you know, you don't have to put a flag on it, but you're you're hinting at stuff. Um, we got away with one line that I, I honestly was surprised we got away with. You know, Roadblock would always speak in these little couplets. And we had him say in one episode, Man, you're cruising for a bruising, posing for a hosing, and shucking for a, and then somebody interrupts him before he can finish it. Uh, and we got away with that. So, you know. There was there's an idea from the animated series. I think it was your concept uh, with the rockets, the uh, Red Rockets restaurants. Was that your concept? Red Rockets. Yeah, that was me. I, I believe that was Mary Scrennis. If I'm wrong, I apologize to Mary and whoever did write it. I didn't write that one. Um, uh, I think Steve edited that one. Um, but yeah, there were there were a lot of things that people worked in. I mean, that we encouraged that. We didn't want simplistic stuff. We wanted stuff that was kind of smart and savvy. Um, a recent author did uh, this uh, novel. This is a kind of a side note. Uh, G.I. Joe classified novel. Uh, mm -hmm. Kelly Scovran, and she mm -hmm. uses the uh, Red Rockets quite a bit in there. She loved uh, watching the cartoons as a child, and now she's an author, and she got the opportunity to do that. And she uses that uh, like mm -hmm. a lot in there. It's really cool how she uses it and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. the impact of your work, and I'm a perfect example because I was a child during that era, and you were working on this stuff that you impacted people like myself and thousands and thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of kids around the world, because this stuff's been syndicated around the world in many different countries. Uh, and that's got to be kind of a daunting thing to uh, accept or to take on as a person that just was a writer on a cartoon or a toy property or whatever in, in as your career. Well, I, I, I tell people when I was was a young teenager, I got involved in science fiction fandom. This would have been in the late 60s, mid to late 60s. And even in the mid to late 60s, people were talking about the legendary EC Comics bullpen. EC Comics, um, they did Tales from the Crypt. They did Vault of Horror. They did uh, Weird Science Fantasy. They did all these cutting edge adult oriented uh when i say adult i don't mean pornographic i mean the sure. story content was adult they did all these adult level stories and they got targeted unfairly as uh you know corrupting kids morals and eventually they were forced out of the comic book business and into the magazine business they took they took mad comics which was which started as a comic book and uh, transformed it into a magazine. And the moment they transformed it into a magazine, all the criticism vanished because that was the hypocrisy of it. If it's a comic book, it can only be for kids. But the moment it became a black and white magazine, people stopped complaining about it. Uh, but anyway, the EC bullpen was 
famous and and the the artists in it um Frank Frazetta, Wally Wood, Graham Ingalls, Bernie Krigstein, Roy Krenkel. I mean, just this incredible lineup of, of, uh, of artistic talent. Uh, stories that were written by Harvey Kurtzman, by um, uh, Al Feldman, Feldstein, excuse me, Feldstein. Um, they adapted stories from Ray Bradbury. Um, and it was just incredible stuff, and and people were still remembering it fondly decades later. And I told people, uh, I always hoped as a as a teenager that someday I could be involved in a really cool project with really cool people, and that people would remember it for years to come. I got my wish. I would say uh, by leaps and bounds, you got your wish because you're remembered for a lot of uh, different uh, genres, different uh, types of material and things like that. So you've you covered the entire gambit uh, as an author, writer uh, and just a personality in the fandom itself. I know you get around a lot of uh, fans uh, always mention you and different things that I've read and stuff like that. So you're not someone that's hiding away. You're out there talking to people. And I appreciate you uh, taking the time to speak with me today. Um, I was a little uh, uh, put off when I uh, I texted you and you answered like almost immediately i was like wow that was fast <laughs> i didn't I, expect I, that i i i spend a lot of time i'm still writing to this day i am focusing now on novels and uh, i don't have anything to announce um novel wise i just had a short story published in mithila review number 16 it's a science fiction anthology it's called trucker and it's a a sci-fi story set in uh, the not too distant future after climate change has drastically changed everything but it's an upbeat positive story it's it's a story about the last three of the last human truckers um you know saving a mother and her child and i've 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 been published i'm going to have a story this year in analog um i've i've had stories published in analog in the past in a variety of science fiction magazines uh all the way back i i i had a story published in national lampoon back in the day so uh um i enjoy writing you usually find me behind my my desk at the keyboard working on something my wife will periodically come up and say buzz move move exercise don't stay at the desk all the time you know she's being very good right now staying downstairs but um uh, you know so that she, we aren't interrupted but writing's what i do that's what i am i've been a storyteller all my life it's it, it's interesting the whole dichotomy of when mm -hmm. i grew up in today and stuff like that and obviously it was different when you grew up uh till when you were writing uh and doing stuff in the 80s as well but I can't imagine just sitting here as much as I love doing this, talking to people and, and interviewing people and learning about uh, people, learning about the history of the things that I love and, and the, the past and stuff like that. I, I can't just stay in here, watch uh, a computer, watch a TV, watch a view screen, be on my phone. I'm not I wasn't brought up that way i was an outdoors type person i i played with my gi joes outside mm -hmm. i had friends in the neighbor we did stuff you know and even my father talks about he he never was inside at all they played kickball mm -hmm. or they played baseball or whatever it was in his uh era uh and stuff like that but today's uh today's generation is a lot different than our generation and it's it's unique trying to uh juxtapose those two things and, and kind of get it in your head well they grew up with this stuff because they have it today maybe we would have had that stuff that maybe we would have grew up we had gaming and, and stuff like that we we didn't stay home maybe my little brother did but he was a handful of years younger than me maybe he he stayed home on the video games and stuff like that well but, you, you're bringing up a very very valid point because mass communication um depending upon where you want to draw the line you could say gutenberg 
uh, in the West was the first person to introduce mass communication. Uh, the Chinese and the Koreans had had uh, movable type printing presses long before Gutenberg. Uh, but you know nobody nobody was bringing the stuff from China and translating it in the in the Western world. Gutenberg was the first European to develop such a system and you know he he radically transformed European society as a result of it, culture as a result. We began um, experiencing modern mass culture after Tesla and Marconi um, popularized radio. And in the 1920s, we began having the first commercial radio broadcasts, which when you read the history of radio, they're, they're not really much different from the first internet websites. It's like, hey, wow, look at this. I've, I've got a website. What do I talk about? I haven't the faintest idea. But it, it was the, the, the start. And by, by the 1920s, some idea of mass communication was out there. Instantaneous mass communication. Movies starting about late 1890s, Nickelodeons, but Movies said there was a way of making one production and sharing it with millions of people. There had been enormous numbers of, of um, traveling shows, of Broadway plays, stuff like this. But you could only show a play to as many people as could fit into that one theater at a time. And only as often as the, the cast had the energy to do it. Movies, you could show a movie five or six times a day. You could show it in dozens of theaters, hundreds of theaters around the country. Um, it was the first time everybody could experience the same thing and have this common shared uh, cultural background. And it's, it's interesting because, as, as I said, when I got involved in science fiction fandom in the 60s, there were a lot of people publishing fanzines. They, they had mimeograph machines. They had spirit duplicators. And they would crank out their own magazines. And you had these unique points of view. I mean, a lot of them were very amateurish, but a lot of them were also very insightful People were writing about stuff that uh, mainstream wouldn't write about because there just there wasn't mainstream interest. But you didn't need mainstream interest. You only needed a couple hundred people to be interested. It's the same thing that's happening now with the internet. the The beauty of the internet is that anybody can have a Facebook page, a TikTok account, uh, a website. It's there's no bar. To participation and depending upon how insightful or interesting you can make what it is you're doing you can you can have a few people interested in what you say you can have thousands you can have millions sure. and and there's really no bar to it anymore um in one way that kind of undermines mass communication because when you can have a thousand voices saying a thousand different things and each each voice is a viable one but it only reaches a thousand ears that's different from a tv show that is going to be seen by seven million eyes regardless um I once got snarky with somebody who was kind of one of these uh, uh, hoity-toity artiste type people. And he was putting down um, a friend who, who wrote um, genre fiction. Well, I don't write that genre stuff. I write literary fiction. <laughs> and I said to him, pal, the worst TV show I ever wrote was seen by more people than will ever read anything you write in your entire life. 
you know, and I normally don't rub that in people's faces, but this guy needed it. You know, <laughs> he just, uh, he had an attitude problem. So, well, the, the thing about a lot of this stuff is you, like I was saying, you're, you're out there. Do you have any, uh, stories of where you had to maybe, uh, um, talk to people and, you know, have issues where they had issues with the work that you obviously they got letters at the studios and stuff like that but if you're out and about at a convention or an appearance or what have you do do you talk to the fans do you see the fans i love all? talking to the fans i am i am always delighted to talk to the fans um and you know and i sometimes get negative feedback people say, i didn't like that episode well you you have a right to not like it every not every work connects with every person. And I don't I don't take it personally. If someone if someone were to go, the traitor is my favorite thing that I wrote. Okay. But if someone comes to me and says, Well, I didn't care for the traitor, I go, okay, fine. The the traitor was not a story you could connect with. No fault of yours, no fault of mine. It just it just wasn't your thing. Um I I tell people, people say, aren't you ever bothered by criticism? And I said, the only criticism that matters to me is the one from the guy who signs the paycheck. <laughs> I'll listen to that person's criticism. I won't necessarily listen to anyone else's. Um, but yeah, we got, we got complaints, odd, weird complaints sometimes, uh, weird fan interactions. I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, we did a G.I. Joe episode called My Brother's Keeper, which is literally about two brothers. And one of the brothers is um, uh, confined to a wheelchair and the other brother has uh, some cognitive issues. And the brother confined to the wheelchair is like really snarky and he picks on his other brother all the time. But by the end of the episode, he realizes they're... Uh, they're brothers. They they love each other. They have to get along. And in the very last shot of the episode, he puts his hand on his brother's shoulder in a friendly way. And these are brothers, mind you. Some father walked in at the tail end of the episode, saw that, and was convinced we were promoting homosexuality. Oh, gosh. And, you know, we... We had to write, they, Hasbro wanted to cut the scene out. And I said, no, just tell the guy, send him a copy of the script and tell him it's two brothers. You know, it's not anything, you know, and they finally convinced the guy, but, uh, you know, that was pretty ridiculous. On the opposite end of the scale, we would get, um, this is a, this is a bit of a story here. Okay. And it's why I don't write large, and I mean, giant female characters anymore. I, I wrote a episode of Web Woman for Filmation Studios where she fights a giant genie, an eight foot tall female genie. And the day the episode aired, that night, about two o'clock in the morning, I get a phone call. And this is back in the days before cell phones. So it's it was cheaper to call long distance after certain hours at night. I get this phone call at two in the morning from this guy who's really excited about the episode because I really like shows about great big women beating up men. <laughs> and I think it's one of my friends, you know, it's somebody I work with. And so I, okay, thank you. You didn't have to call me in the middle of the night. Well, I have to because the rates are cheaper. <laughs> okay, fine. Thank you. You know, I hang up and, and on Monday, uh, there was a guy named Wendell Washer that I thought did this. And I, I kept digging at Wendell saying, you know, well, you know, you know, cause I thought he was pranking me and Wendell had no idea what I was talking about. I thought he was just, you know, bluffing, but it turned out he wasn't. Anyway, so I don't, uh, you know, I don't get a follow-up phone call from this guy until I did a Mighty Orbots episode in which there is a female, a giant female alien who fights the Orbots. And again, I get this phone call in the middle of the night from this guy who really likes great big women beating up men. 
And um, at this point, I know this is a genuine, this is actually a fan. This is not uh, somebody, you know, pulling a prank on me. And again, I, I'm polite, but I disengage as soon as I can. And as soon as I disengage, I made a vow to myself. I am never writing a giant female character ever again. All my, all my female characters are going to be petite from now on. <laughs> so I, I told this story to a friend of mine, a guy named John Dorman. John was a storyboard artist on Thundar the Barbarian. John was one of the all-time Hollywood wild men. We could, we could spend hours talking about crazy John Dorman stories. But John was a dear friend. And I, I mentioned this to John. And John said, I met that guy. And I met him at a comic book convention where I was there with Bob Klein. Now, Bob Klein was a storyboard artist, but he eventually became an animation director. And he directed a lot of the Disney Hercules animated TV show. Mm -hmm. Bob is well-respected in the business. I mean, he's a great artist, great guy, really nice. Bob is one of the nicest, most laid back, nonviolent people you will ever meet. And this is important to the story. You have to know this. Bob is just a sweet, gentle human being. So John's at this show and um, this guy comes up and John described the guy, he said he, he, he was an actual pinhead. His head actually came to a point. <laughs> and the guy had this big folder with him of all these articles he had clipped out of magazines of great big women beating up men. <laughs> and, and John had storyboarded some show where a great big woman beat up a man. And he was eager to share with John all of the articles and talk with John about it and, and everything else. And John's trying to get him to move on. And the guy just keeps going and going. And, and he says to John, I, I got I got this great idea for a TV show. There's this guy and he's 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 out in the field. And this, this meteor hits, and he gets really strong, and he picks up a rock, and he throws it. And John said, and then what happens? Nothing. That's it. <laughs> and John points over to Bob Klein, and he says, go over and tell Bob Klein that. I happen to know he's looking for exactly that kind of story. <laughs> so this guy takes his folder, and he rushes over to talk to Bob Klein. And when the show is over, Klein comes over, grabs uh, John by the collar, slams him against the wall and says, you ever do that again, I will break and kill you. Because uh -huh. <laughs> he couldn't get rid of the guy. <laughs> uh -huh. that's, that's what, there are fans like that. Uh, look, I've been to a million comic conventions since I was a child. I've been yeah. to conventions of all t shaped sizes and stuff. There are, there are different types of people out there. I'm always fond of the old saying, it takes every color of the rainbow to make the world go around. It's yep. just the way yep. the world is. And it I is. think you, you need to have an open mind about this. But there are Absolutely. some uh, eccentric people, uh, you know, uh, even myself. I might have been a, a crazy uh, person one day for an uh, autograph or something like that at a convention. Who knows, you know, as everybody, a fan. Everybody will have that geek out moment. It, it, it may not. You may think you're super cool, but there will eventually be a moment where you will geek out. There will be something that will just make you go, Ooh, it'll, it'll, it'll bring out the fangirl in you. And I don't say that in a derogatory sense. I say it in the sense we've seen the young female fans at conventions. They just, it is, it is delightful to see them so enthusiastic. They're just vibrating with positive energy, more power to them. I don't mind. I mean, I've I've I have dealt with a, a wide variety of fans. I I have dealt with um some people. I mean, at at one convention I was at, this this family brought a kid who was who was in a full body brace oh, who man. loved Transformers, and it's like you know, absolutely this. I'm going to take whatever amount of time you need for me to be with your kid because, you know, the, he was the, he was one of the kids we wrote the show for. Well, you know? and 
that's the thing that I love about uh, 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 you guys, the people that worked on these shows. There's no, I have not uh, encountered a lot of egos with people uh, in the animation industry and stuff like. And, and most of the comic book people are really, really cool people. You know, yeah, there's a couple of celebrities here and there that have got a bit of an inflated head here no. or there, and I won't go into their names. But I was uh, at a convention, uh, a, a show that I. I participated in and I helped run called Joe Fest in Augusta, Georgia, a couple of months ago. And uh, Arthur Burkhart was there, the voice of Destro. And I was at his table and I was helping him with his uh, autograph table and stuff like that. And a, a mom and dad with her son. And you could tell the son was on the spectrum before the mother had said anything. Yeah. She told Arthur, hey, he's on the spectrum and stuff like that. But he loves Destro and he's got this passion about just and so Arthur's very kind, very patient with him. He spends a lot of time with him. And I have to give him a lot of respect for that because the kid was loud and he was yelling and things like oh, that and uh, I, I, yeah. I don't know anything about the spectrum and how this all works so people that are listening to this don't get offended i'm not an expert but i appreciate what arthur did and it it was a difficult situation from my I, point of view yeah watch i it. i uh not not to elicit sympathy but i i have a grandson on the spectrum and when i encounter fans who i recognize I understand them. I understand what is motivating them, that they are enthusiastic and excited, and this is a big event for them, and they have every right in the world to enjoy it as much as anybody else. Yeah. Um, I, I, the, the story about the guy that was fascinated about great big women beating up men, just don't call me at two in the morning, okay? That's all I'm asking, all right? You know, just let me sleep. Um, but I, I, um, I don't fault that. I mean, I have, I have encountered people that, um, professionals and, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to blot out the name here because I don't want to embarrass anybody because the gentleman is still happily married, but I knew a guy who, um, hired women to wrestle with him no sexual activity he just liked wrestling with women and really if the cops were to kick in the door in the middle of this and come in they would find both of them in wrestling costumes and that was it nothing happened you know but he it, it was an obsession with him and it and my attitude was you know as long as you're not putting a headlock on the secretaries, <laughs> you whatever you negotiate in your own time, in your own privacy, you go right ahead and have all the fun you want. Um, not my thing, but you like that, you you go right ahead and enjoy it. You know, I everybody's got their thing. You know? yeah. Is there uh, places where obviously I I went on your um, your uh, your website buzzdixon.com uh, are yeah. there any other places where people the fans can reach out to you in a uh, timely manner not at uh, two in the morning uh, to <laughs> uh, talk to you or say hello or what have you well I'm I'm on Facebook you you should be able to find me pretty easy I am on Twitter uh, I think my handle is Buzz Dixon writer there I'm on Instagram. Um, I, I publish on a daily basis. I put up what I call fictoids where I'll take an old illustration or an old, uh, advertisement and I'll put new dialogue on it. And, um, you know, it, it, it can range up to hard R material. So be, you know, um, be aware of that. You know, it's, it's not going to be kid stuff. Uh, but, um, you know, nothing explicit, nothing, nothing too raunchy. Um, I'm on a couple of other uh, websites, uh, um, but my my principal my principal activity is my blog. Um, I have a Tumblr um, account that's called um, things I do when I should be working, which is, is basically just stuff that goes on my blog or 
on my Instagram account, republish there. Uh, I have Instagram. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. Um, I People keep telling me I should join this, that, and the other thing. Um, it's hard to keep up. It's hard to keep up. And, and I'll be very honest. Sometimes I'm looking at stuff and I can't figure out how it works. <laughs> um, there's one... Um, and I can't even remember the name of it. I, I update daily, but there's one social um, media site that I post the the same things I post on Instagram. I post on this place, and I just have no idea how you interact with people on it. I just I just put my stuff up, and if anybody likes it, they can they can say they like it, and if they don't like it, they don't have to say anything. Um, Instagram, I've kind of figured out, you know, I can communicate with people, you know, they post something, I'll comment, they'll comment in turn. Facebook, you get a lot of good back and forth. Twitter is, um, Twitter's too short, to be honest with you. I, I like a lot more give and take, and you rarely get good, long um, discussions in Twitter. Uh, but, uh, you know, Twitter can be fun, especially if you're following an account that, uh, uh, you know, has some interesting things happening on it. Um, but, yeah, you can find me out there and, and absolutely anybody can say, you know, drop in, say hello and send a message. I, I cannot promise I will respond immediately every time I get a message, but I tend to I tend to respond um uh, to most things, uh, as long as you're not selling cryptocurrency or photographs of you in a bathing suit, um, especially if you're trying to sell crypto photos of you in a bathing suit. Uh, those, I mean, the 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 obvious scam artists, I just block immediately. But uh, 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 do if you do you do appearances? Do you go to conventions at all? I know you're I in will, California. Yeah, I will be at um, Alpha Omega Con, which is a Christian-oriented one-day convention in, I believe it'll be September. I can't remember which weekend, but you look it up online. Uh, I was at San Diego Comic Fest this year, which I really enjoy. It's San Diego Comic Fest has become my favorite convention now because it it is the size of... Um, well, it's, it's like what? Yeah, it's like, <laughs> no, it is like what San Diego Comic Con was before San Diego Comic Con blew up. And it is a small convention where you can talk to people, you can sit down, you can interact. I get to chat with fans. I get to be on panels where uh, there's feedback. Um, I have been invited to various conventions at various times. I probably won't be going to large scale conventions for the next couple of years because um, I'll be very frank. I'm concerned about COVID. I'm I'm in the age cohort that I need to be concerned about it. Um, I'll probably give COVID another couple of years to settle down before I even think about going to uh, uh, something like San Diego Comic Con. But smaller and medium sized shows where you're not packed in like sardines uh yeah i i might very well show up at those things and i i am always delighted to talk to fans and autograph anything they might bring up i would love to uh, invite you to joe fest if uh, you wouldn't mind uh coming out to uh, augusta georgia uh i think with the four, uh, 35th anniversary of gi joe the animated feature film we could do a nice panel with you uh maybe get sergeant slaughter or somebody oh you, my god if you could get the sarge i would love that this he is a trip i he he was so much fun to work with and and i really enjoyed writing for him on the series um yeah i would love that i would love that let me you know if you if you get it when you get it solidified let me know and uh, well, we'll discuss details we have the dates we have the time uh it's uh, uh, the 10th and 11th of uh, June uh, next year, 2023. Uh, JoeFest.com. Uh, the guy that runs it is Ed Schumacher. 
uh, I can send him your contact yeah. uh, to get in touch with you because we're always looking to get uh, new uh, innovative people for the show to broaden the audience space, stuff like that. It's it's not a large show. There's about 5,000 people to 7,000 people, give or take yeah. a year. We got a dip a couple of years ago, obviously, with COVID. That was a rough couple yeah. of years. But, you know, it's not a huge show, but it's a it's a fun show. It's a, it's a G.I. Joe animation uh, toy type of show. We got a lot of voice actors there. We got a lot of comic book people uh, there, but it's mainly a G.I. Joe uh, centric show. But I think I would be I would be delighted to come right now. It looks like my calendar is open for that date. Cool. Let me let me know details. Uh, I, I will make only one caveat and that is uh my wife may have plans for that time and um obviously if you contact me i will find out from her what her plans are uh but uh right now my calendar seems clear so if oh. you'd like me there uh you know just fly me out and put me in a room and yep we do that okay we do all that stuff. But uh, Larry's already confirmed he's going to be there. Oh, great. Yeah, he's he's a wonderful person. I love him. Uh, he and I were at uh, Granite State Comic Con about five, six years ago, maybe a little longer than that. We had a great time. We had a wonderful. This is what I like about small conventions. You, you say, anybody want to go out for dinner? And you can have a half a dozen pros and fans sitting at the same table talking exchanging ideas yeah. um you know that's what this show is exactly well good that's, it's a that's community that's show. show i would like to attend that this is a community show joe fest is a gi joe community and uh we want to include everybody in this community that we can because we love the brand and i know you love the brand obviously and uh the time that you've given me here has been fantastic i i've gone over what i thought i was going to go over uh and I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me. My today. pleasure. It's always my pleasure. Thank you. And we will see you next time.